All right, my friends, Jared Diggs with you. Appreciate everybody joining me today. We are now live. I just hit the live button. We're going to make sure that all of our friends can hear us across all the platforms. If you have any trouble hearing anything, please go ahead and type it in the comments so that we can get it corrected. Looks like we're doing good on X platform so far, a.k.a. Twitter, of course. And, okay, looks good on YouTube. Appreciate again everybody joining. We've got a few interesting topics to go over that you probably have not heard anywhere else. We're going to start with the House of Representatives, Federal House of Representatives. Then we're going to transition over to Sweet Fanny. We've got to talk about Fanny as always, see what she's up to. All right, Facebook is looking good. And, of course, Twitch. All right. If you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself. Let us know where you are from. It is appreciated. Just go ahead and let us know what area of the country, area of the world you are located in. Thanks for joining me as always. For those of you who do not know me, I am J.R. Dukes. I like to talk about things that basically shed light on whatever's going on, current events or otherwise, because I'm a firm believer when you understand better, you can live better. I'm all about preventing and stopping the serious problem of indoctrination. Obviously, it's pervasive in our society. And that is one thing that uh, that really irks me, if you know what I'm saying. And I want to, I think when we talk about it, we can shed a light on it. And when we shed a light on it, we can call it what it is. Lies, indoctrination, half-truths, whatever. Sapphire Ridge, thanks for joining us as always, my friends. Good to see you here. Anybody who would like to join the chat, or I should say would like to join by video. You just need a video camera. You need a microphone. Nothing too fancy. You don't need any special software. You do need to have a Chrome browser, I believe. With that exception, just go ahead, click on that link there, and you'll pop up like magic on the screen here, and you are welcome to join our little chat in case you have any kind of comment or anything you'd like to offer. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start jumping into it right now. Let's take a quick peek. <clears throat> and what I got on the agenda today, everything looks good. Everything seems like it sounds good. So we're going to continue on. All right, here we go. Now, first of all, I'm sure that we are all familiar with what's going on in the House of Representatives. You probably heard of some individuals resigning. We have had a list of individuals that have been leaving the House of Representatives. And just to be clear, I'm talking about the federal House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. The current speaker, of course, is... Mike Johnson. That obviously depends on how much longer that's going to be a reality. I don't really know, but we're going to talk about it, right? If you remember, we had Kevin McCarthy. He was the Speaker of the House last year, and then we had one of the representatives out of Orlando. What was that Matt Gates? He basically filed a motion with one. For some reason, they allowed it to where one person could go ahead and introduce essentially a motion to have the current speaker ousted. I would never accept a job like that where one person of my caucus could simply say, I'm not happy and you're out of here. No way would I subscribe to that. I don't know how you feel, but there's no way I would subscribe to that. But this can be a serious problem for the Republicans. And here's the reason why. Obviously, you had McCarthy. He got ousted. Human nature is such that if you are ousted from a position like that, you are going to go ahead and resign yourself. And that's exactly what he did, says McCarthy, is the only speaker, the only speaker in U.S. history, the only speaker in history to be voted out of a job, no matter the odds or personal costs. We did the right thing. McCarthy told the Wall Street Journal announcing his decision. It's in the spirit that I have decided to depart the House at the end of this year to serve America in new ways. Remember, McCarthy was a rock star for the Republicans. He was a zealous advocate for all the Republican candidates, their causes, and he was probably one of the best fundraisers that the Republican Party had. And unfortunately, he was ousted. And he was ousted for essentially the same thing that Speaker Mike Johnson is doing currently. But what the Republicans fail to understand is failing to stay unified like the Democrats always do. If you notice, folks, the Democrats always stay together. 
they always stay unified because they know, even though they don't see eye to eye, their best bet, the best way for them to reach the goals that they have is to stay unified, uh, unified and vote in tandem. And that's exactly what they always do. Not so much the Republicans. When the Republicans basically have a disagreement, they air it out for everybody to see. They don't take it behind closed doors and they fight and they fight for blood. And this is what happens. So let's go back to my little uh, chart that we have right here. And I'm going to show you something here. All right. So you have McCarthy gone. What did they end up doing? They boosted George Santos. Y'all remember George Santos? That was the individual from, I believe, yeah, he's out of New York. New York State, and he was ousted not because he was convicted of any crime. If I remember right, he is the first person ever. And now the precedent, unfortunately, has been set. He was the first individual in Congress serving in Congress to be ousted without having been convicted of a crime or having been someone that took part in the Confederacy. I believe it's only been five individuals. George Santo is now the sixth that was ousted. But remember, he has not, to this day, he has not been convicted of any crime. And if I'm wrong about that, you're welcome to put that in the comments below and we'll take a look at it together. Again, this is really, I said it back at the time. If you go back and look at the videos that I made on this particular subject in my store, you will see that I came out against this wholeheartedly. I was direct and I was adamant that this was a mistake. And unfortunately, I'm being proven right. Why? Well, the House just had Kevin Buck. He's a Republican who represents Colorado's reliably read fourth congressional district said Tuesday he will resign before his term is up further narrowing the GOP's majority in the chamber. Buck had previously announced he would not seek re-election at the end of his term, which ends in November. But Buck wasn't going quietly. He has been given interviews, and we're going to take a look at one here in a minute. And he is not what I would call a nice person. I do not I do not like this guy at all. He is probably best described as a rhino or one of these never Trumpers because he should have been there as a Democrat, especially with the comments that he is saying on his way out. Now, that brought the majority down to 431 representatives, 218 Republicans, and 213 Democrats. That gave them mathematically a two-vote majority. Well, guess what, friends? Yes, you guessed right. There's another individual that just announced. His name is Mike Gallagher. Mike Gallagher is to resign from the U.S. House of Representatives effective April, uh, April 19th last month. He announced he would not seek re-election. U.S. Rep. Mike Gallagher announced Friday he will step down from the House of Representatives next month. And his situation complicates things even more because with his ouster, that's a one, one seat majority that the Republicans will enjoy. They will technically still control the House, but I'm not done yet. The real bad news is yet to come. Sticking with the Gallagher situation, he is leaving, but he's not leaving like right now. If he left right now before April 9th, the state law in Colorado would allow for, and I want to make sure he's in Colorado, uh, announced for, I believe he's in, I believe he's a representative from Colorado, but at any rate, whatever state he's in, it would allow for them to have a special election if he resigned on or before April 9th. But because he has decided to stick around till April 19th, there will not be a special election until. November, which is basically a normal election. So that's just one more seat that the Republicans will not be able to reclaim or to control. It just cuts their lead ever so much more. Now, I want to briefly compare this to the Republicans, because that's kind of where I'm going with this, or rather the Democrats. You remember Mr. Alarm Puller, the guy that likes to pull the alarm? Well, that's Representative Bowman. He was the one that was charged with pulling a fire alarm in the House office building when there wasn't an emergency. Remember, this was the guy that decided he was going to disrupt Congress because he didn't like the way the vote was going. So what did he do? Oh, they just pulled the we'll just pull the alarm system. <laughs> that's exactly what he did. And of course, he was severely punished for this and he was ousted for his malfeasance. Right. Wrong. He was not. He paid a fine of some sort. 
and that was the end of it. I believe he received a reprimand from Speaker Johnson, and the reprimand went something like this. Representative Bowman, this is an official censure. Or, uh, uh, censure. Here you go. Boom. Done. I, I mean, I'm serious. That was it. Just a couple sentences. It was over with, and this guy paid a fine. Now, of course, the January 6 hostages, they were treated the same way, right? Wrong. We all know that that's not correct. They are currently, I believe there's 140 of them right now, currently serving prison time in prison with felonious convictions right now today as I speak. And they were charged essentially for the same thing that this representative Bowman was accused of, interfering with Congress, interfering with their operations. Bowman gets a fine. As a Democrat, he gets a fine and a couple sentences saying you shouldn't do this. And he's in Congress as of right now today, right? Okay. Well, we got to move on because, I mean, it just gets even better. You have on the Senate side, you have Senator Bob Mendendez. We know him, right? He's old uh, indicted. He's been indicted twice this time around for serious crime, something to do with treason, given secrets to the government of Egypt, just a whole list of terrible crimes. This is the guy caught with gold bars stuck in his pockets. You know what I mean? He had gold bars everywhere, cash everywhere. We, we know these senators. They're obviously always paid with gold bars, right? We know that. I know that. You know that. Yeah, right. Well, guess what? The Democrats leaned on the Republicans saying, you guys need to control your house. You need to control your party. When you have some kind of nastiness going on, you need to get these people out. And the Republicans drank that Kool-Aid, unfortunately. They drank that Kool-Aid. Do you think that they have taken time to reprimand their own? Absolutely not. Nothing. Zip. Not a peep. They will not say anything negative against their own people. Matter of fact, I heard the speaker, the majority leader speaker, the uh, I'm drawing a blank. If you know his name, put it in the comment for me. Uh, who's that uh, senator from New York? Oh, Schumer, uh, Senator Schumer. He was questioned about what I just mentioned to you about uh, Medendez. And he just simply repeated the same parenting thing, uh, something to do with, oh, we expect high standards of our people. And when they don't meet that, we're disappointed. That's pretty well the end of it. That's all he would say. But they were able to collude together and pressure the Republicans who gave into the pressure and ousted George Santos. And now you see exactly what's going on, right? Well, so just to update you, we're at a one seat majority. So I want you to keep this math straight. One seat keeps the House of Representatives in the control, in the hands of the Republicans. One seat. Well, you know, yesterday, Marjorie Taylor Greene, a.k.a. MTG, and I generally like her. Normally I like her. Normally I like Matt Gates. I truly am not too happy with Matt Gates and this McCarthy thing, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, but I, I generally have liked him in the past. Well, you got uh, MTG, we'll call her, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia. So what did she do? She went ahead and filed the same type of paperwork Matt Gates did yesterday in Congress because she didn't get her way. She didn't get what she thinks they should have got in that budget deal. Well, folks, there's a problem here. When you don't control Congress, when you don't have enough to control Congress by a majority or at least a good majority, if not a super majority, you're not going to get everything you want. It's just not going to happen that way. You're going to have to compromise. It's not, it doesn't make me happy. I'm not satisfied with it. Nobody likes what they passed, but you cannot continue to have a government that just shuts down. We got wars, unfortunately, because of Joe Biden all over the world. We got a border in crisis. We got a lot of problems going on and you have to do the work of the people. You have to keep things funded. You have to compromise. Unfortunately, that's just the nature of the beast. And she doesn't see it that way. So she's filed paperwork. Now, I have to tell you, there's one step she has not done yet. There's just like a technicality that she has to do to make her filing official. And then we're going to be right back in the same mess that we were in with Speaker McCarthy. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Let's just play this through. Let's say MTG, she goes ahead and she flicks the switch. 
when they get back in two weeks. And they have to go ahead and they have to convene. You got Mike Johnson. He's on his way out. And now they have to elect somebody else. What do you think is going to happen with Mike Johnson? It's human nature, folks. It is human nature. You're going to see Mike Johnson resign. You're going to see him leave. It's disgraceful to be the leader of the Congress, to be the number one player, if you will. And then you go back to a common seat and have to run for your life's blood every 24 months as a normal representative. I'm just telling you the way this works. It's human nature. I predicted McCarthy would resign, and he did. I said that there's a high likelihood of this happening with people resigning. And unfortunately, I'm right. I really wish I was not right. And now I'm on record talking to everyone here about what I just said. If MTG goes through with this, it's going to cause chaos at a very serious time right now in our country with all the nonsense going on everywhere. And instead of focusing on Donald Trump and his reelection and helping him deal with his problems with this lawfare and all this other nonsense that's going on, it's going to be 24 hour news coverage of how the Republicans cannot manage their own house, manage their own affairs, and it's going to be nonstop playing. And the Republicans are going to look like morons and idiots. This is something she should not do. And I'm publicly calling out on her not to go any more with this. This is terrible. This needs to stop. MTG, if you hear this, stop. You need to rethink this. Don't do this. And again, unfortunately, my prediction is if she does, it's going to be chaos. And you're going to see a speaker, Hakeem Jennings, I think is his name, the Republican, I'm sorry, the Democratic minority leader at this point. You're going to, uh, Hakeem Jeffries. Speaker Hakeem Jeffries is unfortunately going to be the result <clears throat> of all this nonsense. So I, I hope that she's listening and she makes the right choice. But uh, that's really, that's really troublesome when you think about it. You're going to have 200 and some odd Republicans that are going to hope that everybody shows up, no one is late, no one is sick, everybody shows up to work, because if they don't, they're not going to be able to get anything passed. What a shame, what a tragedy. I, I sincerely hope that that they rethink this and they, uh, they, they make a better choice. It's really just that, uh, that simple. And here's a uh, this, what you see on your screen, is a picture, an article here of U.S. Representative Mike Gallagher. We'll step down next month. Gallagher is to resign from the U.S. House Rep Representatives effective April 19th last month. He announced he would not seek re-election. If you don't know who he is, there's his handsome picture right there. All right. And I wanted to read one particular section on this because if he would have resigned, at a, here it is right here, if his resignation took effect before April 9th. Under state law, a special election would have been called to fill the vacancy, but because his, reg his resignation will take effect after that date, there will be party, there will be party primaries in August, and his successor will be chosen in the general election in November. So there will not be a special election to fill his seat, and that is extremely unfortunate because it is another seat that the Republicans cannot use, cannot rely on. So, and he's out of Wisconsin, by the way. It was not Colorado. It was Wisconsin, just to keep everything straight right here. And then finally, we have, uh, we got a video we're going to watch here in a second pertaining to Congressman Ken Buck. He had some interesting things to say. He is not what I would call, let's just say he's not a friend, if you will, of the Republican Party. He, in my opinion, more, I think it's more appropriate if he was frankly setting with the Democrats, because that's what all these people are doing is there's essentially helping the Democratic Party. But folks, unless I'm wrong, this is where this is going. This is what we're going to see. And I, and I, and I hope I'm wrong. Let's take some, let's take a look at some comments here. Sapphire, thanks for joining as always. It needs to be a majority of the Republicans elected. To have. Yes, I hope so. Danny, thanks for joining us as always. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. And CDCBA Republicans are the are acting all righteous guy, and they, yeah, they've always lost seriously. Okay, yeah, I get I get your point there. 
All right, Sue Ann Bray, thanks for joining us. Uh, what do you got here? They got nothing they wanted. Shh. Yeah, it's it's not good. I agree. And then Audrey, MTG needs to sit down. Yeah, I agree. I agree absolutely. And my friend Sapphire, someone needs someone needs to get Gallagher to resign. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I believe he purposely decided he was going to leave on the 19th versus prior to the 9th. I think it's pretty clear. Otherwise, why would he pick that particular date? He knows the rules just like anyone else. So the fact that the fact that he's chosen that particular date is striking. I mean, it's it's I mean, it's planned. The, these people don't make mistakes like this. They know they know exactly what they're doing and they're doing it for whatever reason. Like I said, I uh, with Ken Buck and I think you'll hear a little bit of it here. He is what I would call a Democrat in wolves clothing type thing or just one of these never Trumpers. Either way you want to put it. Let's take a, a listen to this for a minute. Thank you. And I want to go now to the Republican Congressman Ken Buck. He is leaving Congress tomorrow. Uh, a bittersweet, a bittersweet night for you, Congressman. I'm, I'm glad to have you with us and that you're choosing to spend just a few minutes of it with me. Um, and, you know, part of why you're leaving is what's happening, I know, within the, the Republican Party. Uh, you, you see these numbers that Harry broke down. You know them well. Uh, the numbers are worse than they have been in more than 15 years when you look at this for the RNC. What does this mean, Congressman, for the Republican Party? Well, I think you've got to look at a lot of different numbers. One, uh, Donald Trump is leading in the polls in a lot of the swing states. Um, two, uh, Donald Trump was behind Hillary Clinton significantly in, in fundraising in 2016. But these numbers are not good. It, it is clear that the Republican Party needs to gather steam. Uh, one of the differences, I think, was that uh, we had six or seven or eight at one point uh, primary candidates who were uh, siphoning off money from the RNC's efforts and, and from President Trump's efforts. So I think you'll see a rebound in President Trump's numbers, but they still are, are very far behind. Yeah, it certainly are. And I know some of those, um, Nikki Haley, some of her biggest donors actually uh, have now said they're actually going to be go donating to Biden. I mean, there is there is a schism uh, in, in your part. The Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley donors that are now donating to Biden, they never were Republicans. They were always closet Democrats, a.k.a. independents or something along that line. Party. And and in part because of how they, they, they perceive Donald Trump within your party and also how they're handling President Biden. Uh, you, Congressman Buck, have been critical of your party's rush to impeach Democrats, right? I'm talking about plural, right? Mayorkas, uh, Biden, uh, more than one. There was that oversight committee yesterday in the Biden impeachment hearing. Uh, at that time, I mean, they had somebody question, you know, testifying from prison. Uh, there wasn't a smoking gun um, and they don't have the votes to go through with it. They simply don't. Your colleague, Tim Burchett, said as much. He was very blunt. He said, we're not going to have the votes. And I don't think we ever did. All right. That's an honest assessment by Congressman Burchett. Is it time, do you think, to end this? Well, I think the investigation is warranted in terms of looking at what Hunter Biden did. I think that we may want to uh, look at laws that restrict the family members of the president and vice president in terms of outside of, uh, influences. Um, but, but yes, I think for the part, this uh, investigation has run its course. It may go for uh, another four, six, uh, eight weeks, but for the most part, I think that the uh, evidence has been uncovered um, and the, the, the damage has really been done. And, and uh, the American people need to assess uh, exactly what kind of influence was there, but uh, we need to move on. We need to uh, do a much better job of spending bills. We need to do a much better job of funding Ukraine, for example. There are a lot of major issues that we should be looking at. Um, this is a, a sideshow, uh, and it should probably end in, in the next few weeks. And, you know, when you say it's a sideshow and you're talking about important things, Ukraine, you're talking about avoiding another government, another government shutdown. These are things that matter deeply, existentially to this country. And your focus on them, frankly, is at odds with some of your Republican colleagues. And some of them want you to pay a price for it. I mean, you know, if I was looking at things today, I don't even want to play them all. But, you know, they say you play party politics. They say that you're not upholding the Constitution. And then they've come out just before you are leaving Congress and said they're going to kick you out of the Freedom Caucus just days before your exit. They're going to kick you out. Um, done, obviously, um, just, you know, petulantly to make a point. 
I have to ask you, Congressman, and I'm sure tonight is a night that you're reflecting on this. What is going to happen to your party with more and more people like you who are willing to say that important substantive things matter are leaving Congress? Yeah, I don't think it's good. I, uh, obviously, the number of people that's leaving has always been uh, scrutinized. I think now you have to look at the quality of people who are leaving, who are frustrated, who can't uh, feel like they're getting things done. And, and that's an important number also. Um, my friend Mike Gallagher from Wisconsin, what a, a young, bright, hardworking uh, person who reaches across the aisle, gets great work done, leaving Congress. Um, those are the people I think that we need to keep in Congress. Uh, we need to deal with the, the... Well, folks, what they don't tell you, and that's enough on this video, what they don't tell you is that these individuals that he's referring to, they, uh, it, it, I should say it this way, it's always normal that a certain amount of representatives retire, especially when they have picked a nominee, it's it's pretty normal that you're going to get some that retire. These particular individuals that are retiring have come out in the press really, really heavy against Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. In other words, they don't want to fall in line and do what the will of the voters are. I mean, overwhelmingly, people want Donald Trump as the next president. These individuals don't like that. They're kind of like um, Mitt Romney one of these individuals that in their back of their mind, they're going to do everything they possibly can to undermine president Donald Trump. It doesn't matter that the voters want him as the next president. They think they know better. They're, they are no different than many of these liberal Democrats. And that's just the way it is. One other point I want to mention out is when you see, when you see reporters and, and, and admittedly, this is CNN. I like to look at some of these liberal networks because I can, shine a light on it and tell you clearly exactly how they're lying, why they're lying, and what kind of spin they're putting on it. I know most of you probably figured out yourself, but I still think it's a good idea to magnify it and to talk about it. And you always hear them talk about these Nikki Haley independents that are now going to go ahead and support Biden. That's a lie. At a minimum, it's a red herring because when you look at New Hampshire and a few of the other states that she ran in and had a decent showing, or at least a, let's just say she had over 10%, almost all of those voters were either Democrats that were allowed to cross over and vote in the Republican primary, which they should not allow, but many states allow that. You, you can cross party lines in the primary and vote in the Republican primary primary if you want to. It just depends on the state law. They should not allow that, but it does happen from time to time. Now, they cannot vote in the Democratic primary at the same time. They have to choose one or the other. But just to embarrass President Donald Trump, that's exactly what they do, is they cross over the party lines and vote for someone like Nikki Haley in an attempt to embarrass Donald Trump. That's all that that boils down to. So it's either individuals like that that were supporting her or they were individuals that were independents, but they really are Democrats. Most, most of the times when you hear someone described as an independent, they are indeed a Democrat. They, for whatever reason, just don't want to caucus officially with the Democrats. But generally, when they get elected to Congress, if they get elected to Congress or the House or, uh, or the Senate, I should say, or whatever, they almost always caucus with the Democrats. So it's just something for you to observe. Now, I want to bounce over. We're going to take a quick peek at this next video, which is going to be MTG. And you can listen to a little bit of this here. Remember that um, she is enjoying, I, I would say she's enjoying this 15 minutes of fame, so to speak. I also believe she is realistically upset about the bill that was passed. But like I said earlier, they have to compromise. There's no other way to get a bill with one, two, three seat majority of, of your members that you can lose w w without, without compromise. It's just impossible because the Republicans refuse to stick together out of party loyalty. They just will not do that. It's either their way or no way, and, and that has to stop. But let's uh, try to stomach a little of this MSBCBS, and uh, we'll, we'll shine a light on it. So here we go. Yet another Republican congressman has decided to quit his job rather than deal with the toxically dysfunctional GOP House majority. 
Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin just started serving in the House in 2017, relatively young guy. And he's kind of a standard conservative Republican. He's got a plum assignment as the head of the Select Committee on China. He voted with Trump most of the time, voted in favor of tax cuts against abortion. Today, he announced he'll be leaving Congress, wait for it, not the end of the year, on April 19th. He, he, he can't take it. He needs to get out. He's not even going to serve out the next 10 months, which will leave the Republican Party with one of the slimmest majorities in history. Last month, you might recall, they lost the special election for the seat formerly occupied by George Santos. Then Colorado Republican Ken Buck resigned. His last day was today. Again, he's not waiting around till the end of the term. And now Mike Gallagher is like, peace, everyone. As of tonight, Republicans have a 218 to 213 majority. So they can only lose two votes on a party line bill. Once Gallagher leaves, they can only lose one vote. If more than one single Republican deflects after, 19, after April 19th, they lose the vote. They will need Democrats to help pass legislation. The 118th Congress is in utter shambles. So you can understand a bit why Gallagher and Barr. And, and if MTG does what I just mentioned, and then that forces Mike Johnson to quit, we know how that's going to end because we understand human nature. Come on out. Just look at what happened there today, okay? First... A majority of Republicans voted against Speaker Mike Johnson's big spending bill to keep the government open and funded. Then Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to kick him out of his job. Today I filed a motion to vacate after Speaker Johnson has betrayed our conference and broken our rules. This is basically a warning and it's time for us to go through, through the process, take our time and find a new Speaker of the House that will stand with Republicans and our Republican majority instead of standing with the Democrats. Sal Kapoor is a senior national political reporter for NBC News who's been covering this bad day for House Republicans as he writes it up, and he joins me now. Um, there's a lot to get to here, so let's just start with the Gallagher announcement, because I just I, I want to stress to people, this really doesn't happen that much. I mean, you've got Kevin McCarthy leaving, leaving. Ken Buck, now Gallagher. Like, how did this land in, in the Capitol today? Well, it was shocking to many Republicans, Chris. It's exceedingly rare to see this many prominent members of a majority party in the House resign mid-session. And Gallagher was a particularly shocking one because he is one of the youngest Republicans in the chamber. He has been you know, pegged as a rising star within the party. He's only 40 years old. He just turned 40 uh, recently, and he has decided he's had enough of this place. His one recent vote that went against his party was the vote uh, on impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas. He voted against that. Uh, he said uh. it was not a good idea. And other than that, he's generally voted with the team. He's not been someone who's, you know, who's been bucking the party line or, or making demands of the party necessarily. So that was a particularly uh, shocking uh, situation that, that Gallagher is leaving. Kind of a, a you know, reminder that institutionalists in the party are not very happy these days. Uh, let me just n note that Mike Gallagher and Buck, uh, along with Tom McClintock, were, were two of the three, right? So people who are <laughs> eyeing the exits were like, yeah, this is nonsense. Uh, uh, so now you've got this situation where the majority, oh, first of all, my understanding is according to Wisconsin law, there will be no special, that he, if, if, he, he, if he left earlier, like April 2nd, there would have been a special election, but waiting to April 19th, means the seat stays open the rest of the year and the, the Republicans can't get that back. Yeah, that does seem to be the situation right now, Chris, which makes it even harder for Speaker Johnson to be able to govern for the rest of this year. He's looking at a one-seat majority, as you just pointed out. The margins are going down, down, down. There are some vacancies uh, left to fill, although there's a chance that one safe Democratic seat in New York could be filled, which thins his margin even further. Uh, makes it even tougher for him in the event of an absence or two to pass bills. And the, the Ken Buck situation, that, that's very instructive. I mean, Ken Buck is a conservative hardliner. He's a member of the Freedom Caucus. He has unassailable fiscal conservative credentials, so conservative, in fact, that he cost his party a Senate seat in Colorado. That's not exactly true. I've heard interviews of this Ken Buck, and he is definitely not what I would call conservative. He was ripping into MAGA and Donald Trump. And folks, when you get right down to it, MAGA is the Republican Party. There really is no difference between MAGA Republicans and Republicans. It's generally one and the same. I guess you could get into the technical weeds of what the difference is, but for the most part, for all practical purposes, it's one and the same. We're a united Republican MAGA party. We're all together trying to 
elect our nominee, former President Donald Trump, as the next president of the United States. It's just that simple. So to to when you see these liberal folks trying to split this off, it's just smoke and mirrors. It's really nonsense. It's uh, again, that's pro probably more of a red herring. And also notice President Joe Biden, every chance he gets, despite his inauguration speech where he's talking about coming together and being a president for everyone. And he, he was going to be uh, the, the person that brings the country together. Every chance he gets, he pulls a Hillary Clinton, you know, these basket of deplorables. Uh, he talks all the time about these MAGA, these MAGA Republicans, like we're some kind of disease or something. It's, it's really sickening and it's insulting that they think that our intelligence level is so lacking that we would swallow that nonsense. So, all right, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about Sweet Fanny, the Sweet Fanny from Fulton County, Georgia. We are all familiar with the bogus RICO case filed by Fanny Willis in her office, and she was just caught by the judge engaging, and we'll just call it malfeasance, to the point to where at least her special prosecutor, boyfriend, Paramoy, Paramore, was instructed out of there to get out of the case. Also, the judge did allow for what we have been talking about many times, this interlocutory appeal, which is an appeal during a case, which is rather unusual. Normally, you get an appeal at the end of a trial, at the end of a civil trial, at the end of a criminal trial. Rarely, a judge will allow or a person is allowed to file for an interlocutory appeal when something like this happens. Now, in the state of Georgia, you have to have permission of the judge to file an interlocutory appeal. It's not that way in all states. Additionally, in the state of Georgia, the Court of Appeals has to accept it. I personally think the Court of Appeals will accept it. Most of the talking heads on TV are saying that they will not accept it. But the reason I think they will accept it is because this is the kind of case they look for, where you have the law is unclear. For example, in this particular situation, it really has nothing to do with Donald Trump, if you can believe that. It has everything to do with when is it allowed for a prosecutor, a DA, to be removed off the case because the case law is unclear. The state law is unclear. There's case law saying that if the appearance of something improper is there, the DA has to go. And then there's case law that also says you have to basically prove that there is some type of malfeasance. It has to, it's, it's a higher bar of proof. This is the type of case that a court of appeals, frankly, a state Supreme Court would be interested in and in deciding the law for the state of Georgia. If they don't take the case, I would be rather surprised. Because remember, even though Georgia is somewhat of a purple state now, it's still, in my opinion, is a red-ish state. The state government is overwhelmingly controlled by the Republicans, and most, if not all, of the judges on the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court have been appointed by Republican uh, candidates, Republican governors, this type of thing. So stay tuned. We'll see how this goes. Now, back on Fanny, sweet Fanny, she just never learns her lesson. This woman is just stupid, absolutely stupid. I, I want to also point out that I firmly believe that the Supreme Court, unlike the other pundits that you hear about all the time, I think the United States Supreme Court, just so I'm clear as to what Supreme Court I'm talking about, I firmly believe that the United States Supreme Court is going to, uh, you, you know, they're taking uh, arguments, I believe it's April 25th, April 26th, on Donald Trump's appeal asking for absolute immunity as president of the United States. And listen, this is a very important subject. I have been studying this intensely. The bottom line is this. I think the Supreme Court is going to give a president absolute immunity for his official acts. I don't see any way they do not. And if they don't, God help us all, because that will essentially be a way for the judiciary branch to swallow up the executive branch. Instead of having three separate but equal branches of government, you will now have the judicial branch de facto in charge of the presidency because every president from this day forward will be worried about a pair of handcuffs waiting on them for one of the 2,300 prosecutors, solicitors that would have the authority to have a then former president arrested for whatever. For example, you had Joe Biden with that 
terrible withdrawal out of F, uh, was Afghanistan, where you had five American soldiers killed. What happens if he leaves office and one of the prosecutors decides that his decision was too hasty and his hasty decision boiled down to some type of manslaughter charge? So they file charges on Joe Biden and he's arrested. I'm telling you, that's where this is going to head if it's allowed to stand. Now, we'll talk about it at a later date that one Supreme Court that was hearing this case, the uh, I'm sorry, the Court of Appeals out of the, I believe it was the District of Columbia, came up with that question that the attorney was not prepared for, something to do with what if SEAL Team, SEAL Team 4 or 5, whatever, if, they inst if the president instructed them to take out the leading candidate. Well, there's a lot to say about that. That is not an official act of a president. That would be something different. I'm just telling you that this is the way they're going to have to rule. And if they don't rule that way, God help, help us all. And I've had someone mention to me, well, how is it that we can tolerate having a president that's above the law? And the way I answer that is no one's above the law. But when we elect a president, the remedy is the Congress can impeach him and the Senate can remove him. And I've had the same individual I'm thinking of tell me, oh, well, that can be a problem because the president could simply resign before Congress could impeach him, and then there's no criminal liability. And my response to it is this. Our founding fathers were aware of this. If you read the Federalist Papers, they were concerned about a lot of these type of issues. They were definitely concerned with the president, the position of the president, being weakened, weakened by impeachment, weakened by prosecutors going after him. This is a longstanding tradition in our country that a president cannot be charged while he is president of the United States or after he's president of the United States for anything and everything he's done as president of the United States. And if they change that, God help us all. Remember this, even if under some theory, some weird scenario, the president of the United States, whether it is Donald Trump, Joe Biden or whatever, if somehow they commit malfeasance and they escape justice, that's just a price that you and I have to pay for our freedom. It's worth the chance that one person might get away with some type of malfeasance. It's more important that we all have our liberty and have our freedom. And that's what I want you to remember when we get around to discussing this issue. I hope that that is clear enough for everybody to understand. Nothing created by a man, nothing created by men and women, anything is going to be perfect. Even our founding fathers, with all the wisdom they apparently had, it's, it's, just, it's just not a perfect scenario. What is important is that we maintain our liberty. And I'll let it go at that. So, Getting back to Sweet Fanny, despite what I said about I, I believe all this is going to go away magically by the U.S. Supreme Court in short order, in addition to these bogus cases by Jack Smith and the civil nonsense going on with Judge Ingeron and these other idiots up there. I think that that is going to be a first class Eighth Amendment appeal. I think that is going to be a defining Eighth Amendment appeal. I think it's going to be one of the most important Eighth Amendment clarification cases, if you will, in our nation's history. I don't remember an Eighth Amendment appeal, at least in my lifetime. I'm sure there has. I'd have to check further into it. I'm very certain that they're going to find these type of fines, this type of lawfare, this type of legalization of lawfare to be unconstitutional pursuant to the Eighth Amendment. Thank God for those first 10 amendments. I mean, what a, what a stroke of wisdom that those were put in uh, to protect us all. All right, without further ado, sweet Fanny cannot keep her mouth shut. She wants to talk to you about a train that is coming. You know, you would think she'd learn the first time she got in trouble in court by supporting the candidate of a guy she was trying to put in jail. You think she would learn with this last fiasco that almost had her completely disqualified by going to A&E church and telling everybody that uh, God is on her side and that everybody else is a racist. No, she didn't learn nothing. And you're about to see it right now. So without further ado, let's take a peek at sweet Fanny. 
All right, this CNN exclusive, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis is defending herself, her reputation, and her team's work in her first public comments since Judge Scott McAfee's decision to keep her on the election subversion case. CNN's Rafael Romo is with us now on how CNN caught up with Willis and what she had to say today. Yeah, uh, I have to give credit to our very dynamic producer, Jade, uh, Tim Garcia, who managed to get this interview. Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis spent her Saturday at an Easter egg hunt. The event was put together by WAVE, an organization of law enforcement officers dedicated to helping children and the homeless throughout the year. Willis was surprisingly candid, Fred, regarding questions about the last few months of her life, including her Georgia election interfering case against Donald Trump and the scandal brought about by her prior romantic relationship with special prosecutor she appointed for the case. We wanted to know if she uh, feels like she needs to reclaim her reputation, and this was her reply. I don't feel like my reputation needs to be reclaimed. Let's say it for the record. I'm not embarrassed by anything I've done. Um, you know, I guess my greatest crime is I had a relationship with a man, but that's not something that I find embarrassing in any way. Um, and I know that I have not done anything that's illegal. The racketeering case was delayed by two months. So let's remember. Where well, she has a real high opinion of herself, doesn't she? She has the gall to say there she has nothing to be embarrassed of. She's done nothing wrong. Oh, my goodness. The, the hubris of this woman is just unbelievable. Clearly, this is what you call a DEI candidate. I don't know how she got through law school or got this job. This woman is a complete and utter idiot. She's I don't use the word racist lightly. She is a racist. And it pains me to have to say that. But I have to tell you the reality. You don't go to church and talk like that about other people. What is the matter with this woman? Remember, following the revelations about her personal life, her decision-making credibility was also damaged in the eyes of Judge Scott McAfee. But the embattled Fulton County District Attorney said the main case was not delayed because her team never stopped working on it. Let's take a listen. Um, no, my team's been continuing to work, if, and I think the media and especially organizations like your own have been paying attention. All while that was going on, we were writing responsive briefs. We were still doing the case in the way that it needed to be done. Um, I don't feel like we've been slowed down at all. Um, I do think that there are efforts to slow down this train, but the train is coming. The train is coming, she said, Fred, if you didn't uh, hear that. Uh, and uh, CNN reported exclusively on Thursday, Willis plans to press ahead with her goal of putting Donald Trump on trial before the November election, according to three people familiar with her plan. Yeah, I think if a train is coming, a train is coming for her. I think the train is coming where she's going to be reviewed. You should see this list of cases that I've been compiling that Fannie, w that Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade, for that matter, are still facing everything from the federal House, the federal Senate. You got Jim Jordan looking into her. You got all kinds of different commissions looking at her inside the state of Georgia. You have the Senate. They just passed a law where now they have a tribunal that can look into DAs and remove them if necessary. She has a lot to be worried about. And one last thing I want to tell you any type of RICO case, it does not move this fast. It moves very, very painfully slow. It always has moved slow. And just because she wants it to move fast doesn't mean it's going to move fast. It's not the state that's entitled to a speedy trial. It's the defendant that has a right to a speedy trial, not the government. And don't let them tell you differently. And she also intends to ask the judge presiding over the Georgia criminal case to schedule a trial date as soon as this summer. And finally, and this is very important, Fred, let's remember that Willis is seeking to get reelected in November. So she's got a lot on her place. To that, say is, the least. that is a lot. But she sounds uh, very confident mm -hmm. about being prepared to carry on. That's right. All right. Rafael Romo, uh, thank you so much to you and Jade for bringing this to us. All right, back with us right now, former federal prosecutor Ankush Kadori. He is now a senior writer for Political Magazine. So Ankush, you heard uh, from Fonnie Willis uh, there. And uh, she is unwavering. She says they have continued to do the work, even though there was that two month delay while, uh, you know, her behavior uh, was under investigation. So should the trial get underway this summer? She says her team is ready.
Well, I mean, look, uh, if if it can be done this summer, right, and her team is ready and all the defendants are ready and the judge is ready, uh, that would be a perfectly appropriate thing to do. The problem is that it is not entirely up to her. Um, last summer, this case was filed and it was already going to be ambitious, even at that point in time, to bring a case like this, 19 defendants, complicated issues, high profile issues, novel issues to trial in a year. Um, so that was already going to be a very, very heavy lift. At where we are now, there's still a bunch of pending issues, uh, significant pretrial issues. And of course, there is still um, the defendant's intended appeal from Judge McAfee's decision allowing Willis and her office to stay on the case. And the reason why that one is particularly important is a very, is a very practical reason. I'm yeah. sure folks will immediately recognize the judge is not going to want to have a trial if the verdict from that trial later needs to be thrown out because the prosecutor on the case was disqualified in the uh, in the interim. Right. So he's not going to want to have a trial mm -hmm. before that is fully resolved at the appeal level because it would be a waste of time and it would be bad for him personally mm -hmm. if he got reversed and the trial was meaningless. Uh, did you feel that uh, Judge McAfee's uh, decision was appeal proof? I've heard some define it that way uh, because he went beyond his explanation as to why uh, he believes she should stay on the case, yet at the same time reprimanded her. Did that essentially protect his decision to keep her on the case so that, as the Trump team says it wants to appeal, they may not really have anything in which to appeal it on? Yeah, I do think the, the odds of a success are quite low because I thought the judge's opinion was well, well constructed. I disagree with that comment. He made detailed factual findings, including as to credibility, which are very difficult for appeals courts to uh, second guess. But um, even if it's a low probability, even if you're the judge, it's a 5%. It's a one out of 20 chance that he'll, he'll eventually be reversed. I, mean, I, I totally disagree with that. I, I said earlier what I think the Court of Appeals is going to look at in deciding whether to take the case. But I could be wrong. You never know what they're going to say. But to, to say it's a low probability, I don't think so. The judge has already certified it to go up, and now it's just up to the Court of Appeals. Unfortunately, everything is political, even with the court system. That's what we get when we have elected judges. I believe the Court of Appeals is an appointed position, so it's a little bit better. But they are appointed by Republican elect elected individuals, which generally means this type of thing will probably be taken up, but we'll see. He's going to be thinking about the practicalities of putting the country through a trial uh, that mm -hmm. may be upended even on a small percentage chance. Now, now that is a good point. If this judge wanted to rush this, he would rethink that because he does not want to go forward and hurry a trial when there's a good likelihood that it might be reversed. It will do no one no good. It doesn't do the defendants any good. It's not good for the prosecution. And it's definitely not good for the country. And he is right. The judge will consider all of this. And I believe he's going to say in a second that the judge is in no mood after all of this nonsense to do any favors for the Fannie Willis administration. And I have to agree with that. And would it, it also uh, seem, because you've got the same judge who would be overseeing the subversion, election subversion case, wouldn't it also seem that uh, he would feel almost an obligation uh, to try to honor a speedy trial because there was this two month delay uh, because the co-defendants um, had filed this complaint you know, against the prosecutor. And now that his decision has been rendered, does the judge feel compelled to get on with the case, so to speak? I would think that the judge is, is very happy to just turn the page and keep this moving. Um, the question is whether it can move that quickly, mm -hmm. right? And I think the closest analog uh, that particularly folks in the Atlanta era, area will be familiar with is the Young Thug trial, right? Which involves a lot of um, people in and around the um, entertainment industry. That case has been going on for a couple of years. It's still going on. Um, and it's the closest comparator just in the scale, the number of defendants, the comp complexity of the case. And that's gone on for years. Okay. He's talking about right now in Atlanta, there is a RICO case by the Fannie Willis company involving a rapper named Young Thug. And this particular case has been going on for years. That's generally the way it takes for a RICO case. In my experience, the cases I have seen, just to pick a jury in a RICO case can take a year. The, these cases are extremely complex, extremely burdensome, tons of documents. And just because Fannie Willis wants to hurry up and attempt to get a bogus conviction before the election, there, you know, basically she's committing in election interference. She's a Democrat. 
trying to help out the Biden administration. We know that for a whole list of reasons, including secret, quote unquote, secret meetings between Fannie Willis and the current vice president, Camilla Harris, that is documented, well documented, I might say, just because she wants a speedy trial doesn't mean it's going to happen. And I wholeheartedly agree with what he just said. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, and I would just one last point, I guess I would make, which is relevant to that. The judge issued a rel re relatively cr highly critical opinion. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way of, of the DA and question her credibility Out on a very practical, psychological, human level. We should not expect him to be in the mood to do any favors for her now. Mm. And then, I mean, I guess my last question was, you know, how might a further delay impair the readiness of the team that uh, Willis says they have right now? Um, you know, uh, the government is very good at maintaining continuity of uh, the people working cases, particularly very important cases. Um, there, there'll be attorneys who we will never even hear about, who I'm sure are working on the case, investigators th that way too. Um, so I wouldn't expect uh, the delay itself. I, I, I think we should all take Willis fully at her word when she says the office is doing everything it's, it can to move this case along as expeditiously as possible. Yeah, also her words were, the train is coming to underscore her and her team's. Yeah, I, I agree, Fanny. The, the train is coming, but I don't think it's the type of train she wants to see coming. I would not want to trade places with Fanny Willis for any reason under any type of circumstance. Imagine that you have the House representatives threatening you with via Jim Jordan. I'm talking about the federal House of Representatives threatening you with contempt of Congress. There is a guy, Peter Navarro, right now who is in prison for three or four months for contempt of Congress. They will go after her and put her in jail, in prison, if they have to. At least we hope that that would happen if she continues to defy Congress. She has the Georgia State Bar investigator. She has the House of Representatives in the state of Georgia. She's facing 22 counts of impeachment there. There are a number of agencies. I'll, I'll try to compile my list and make sure it's 100% correct, and we'll go over it next time. But I currently have 15 or 16 different situations that Fannie Willis and company are involved in. And, and it ranges from what I just said to different lawsuits involving the fact she will not turn over records. And listen, this particular hearing that she just got away with, this one she just barely survived for now to stay on this case, she didn't turn over her cell phone records, her uh, a whole list of data that is somewhat privileged that they're not able to get out of her at this juncture. It doesn't mean the House of Representatives federally can't get that information through discovery. It doesn't mean that the state of Georgia can't get it via some of their numerous investigations. So we'll just have to see exactly how this works out. Now, let me see what questions y'all have for me here. Okay, Dorothy, thanks for joining us. She needs to take the train to Congress because they're looking for, I agree, I agree. She is, uh, you know, what's the old expression? Pride cometh before a fall. We all know how that works, you know. Shame on her. I, I really, I don't want to see anybody really get in trouble, but what really aggravates me about Fannie Willis and these individuals, and you've heard me say this before, these people are trying to screw up our country. They're trying to change our society fundamentally, take our freedoms away, make it to where lawfare is normal. That's literally what they do in Russia, what they do in Venezuela, what they do in a list of countries where you're not free. It, it, is, it is such a criminal shame what she and her associates are doing, including but not limited to the Joe Biden administration. And I hope that she faces accountability. Sapphire, Mer uh, see, Ashley Merchant said that the appeals board can order a new hearing. That's exactly right. And uh, see, with the new evidence and the appeals. Yeah, she uh, we're going to look at that. We were going to look at it tonight, but I we don't have time for it. Um, I will say, you know how much I love Ashley Merchant? I think she rocks. They are actively, that, that's another situation going on. They are actively obtaining more evidence, more records, 
more receipts as far as expenditures they had, this type of thing. And this is not over. I told you a long time ago, no matter what happens with Fannie Willis, this RICO case is dead. And I stand by every single word. All right, folks, it's been right at an hour. So we're going to cut it here. I, I want to tell you, I appreciate each and every one of you joining me. I always say, keep that mind free and never give up. And until next time, my friends, I am J.R. Dukes.